History tells us that you can, or we can, beat authoritarianism. Professor Noam Chomsky drops by to discuss this. Check it out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. Now, on the line with us is Professor Noam Chomsky. He's currently the laureate Laureate Professor of Linguistics at the University of Arizona, previously at MIT, the Institute Professor uh, of Linguistics Emeritus, author of numerous books, including Optimism Over Despair on Capitalism, Empire, and Social Change. His latest project is uh, author of a chapter in the book Turnout, Mobilizing Voters in an Emergency. Chomsky.info is his website. And Professor Chomsky, welcome, uh, welcome to our program. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if, first of all, thanks so much for joining us today. I, I, I hope all is well with you. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on the movement toward fascism in the United States. If you, if you want to share with us your understanding of an operational definition of fascism, and to what extent our overall political systems and our two major political parties are moving in that direction and why? Well, first of all, it's not the two political parties. It's uh, the Democrats are pretty much what they used to be. The, uh, they're split between a kind of an estab Clintonite establishment, which is not very different from what used to be called moderate Republicans, and a popular base, which is uh, much of it under the Sanders umbrella, which is moving well to the left. The Republicans have gone way off the spectrum. They're now ranked in international rankings uh, with uh, some of the uh, European parties that have neo-fascist origins. Uh, and uh, if even the mainstream commentators describe them as... Uh, radical insurgency, which has abandoned parliamentary politics. This has become very extreme under Trump, but it's been going on for some time. Uh, the term fascism, I think, is thrown around much too loosely. Uh, there are many symptoms that are common to what we saw in the fascist states, like uh, resort to violence, uh, calling in troops to repress uh, uh, protesters, things like that. But it's not fascism. I mean, to, uh, it does too much credit to Trump to call him an incipient fascist. Fascism was an ideology, a conception, a way to organize society. But this is way beyond his pay grade. Uh, he's a tin-pot dictator trying to maintain control for himself and for the groups that he serves with uh, uh, the passion and the dedication, ultra wealth and corporate power. Now, fascism was very different. Now, fascism meant that the powerful state under the control of the uh, dominant party at the maximal leader which control all of society, uh, it would, including the business world. They would be under the control of the maximum leader in his uh, party with uh, you know, brown shirts and black shirts in the streets enforcing it. But that's not our system. We're nowhere near that. In fact, we're closer to the opposite, where the business world uh, basically control, pretty much controls the government. So there are very ugly and dangerous signs, but they, I think they should be regarded as like kind of what's like happening in a small uh, third world uh, neo-colony uh, where there's a, a, a harsh dictator, a country who, uh, which has a military coup of a couple of years and is falling apart. Uh, that's not fascism. Of course, the United States does have resilient institutions which can overcome this. It's a phenomenon that's taking place. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to prevail. And so when uh, Trump called in uh, federal troops to impose his rule over Washington and dominate uh, the protesters with uh, fierce, vicious dogs and so on, he tried. 
but he failed. The Pentagon wouldn't accept it and withdrew the troops. Uh, in the case of Portland, I think he realized he can't use federal troops. The military won't agree with it. So he used paramilitaries, uh, the Border Patrol, which functions not far from where I live in Tucson, which is a basically a lawless paramilitary militia do what they like in the border areas and they can go wild in Portland too but they had to be withdrawn so these are very dangerous signs and there are more things to worry about uh, Trump's latest uh, Pentagon appointment which he made by an executive order yesterday top official in the Pentagon Tata, couldn't pass congressional review so he just appointed it uh, that's very much like the his purge of the executive branch. If inspector generals are coming too close to investigating his swamp, that is swamp that he's created in Washington, then fire them all. And the Senate Republicans uh, are cowed. They don't raise a word of protest. Charles Grassley made a mild protest, and that was about it. Uh, this is... It's a very, these are dangerous signs, and we should be wary of them. But they are not in a situation where they can get out of control. We're not in Germany in 1932. Where did this, in your opinion, Professor Chomsky, begin? Was this, is this the, the, the logical outgrowth of the Powell memo or out of the Supreme Court's Buckley and Bellotti decisions that basically said it's okay to own and, and bribe politicians, it's now legal? Or was this the consequence of the Nixon administration? Or is this all the child of Reaganism? I mean, you know, the, these, uh, we've seen this kind of authoritarianism floating around in American society, you know, throughout our history, certainly. But in the modern era, uh, we have a, a, a little more, uh, just a little short of two minutes before we're going to hit our, uh, our first break here. Yeah. Well, we've gone through 40 years of a neoliberal assault on the society, and in fact, on much of the world. It began with late Carter, took off under Reagan. The effects are very clear and explicit, and it was pretty obvious it was going to happen. Uh, when you, uh, the, uh, the system has been designed, there's no time to go through the details, but it's been designed so that there's tremendous accumulation of wealth in a tiny percentage of the population. 0.1% of the population has 20% of the wealth. That's about twice as much as before Reagan. Uh, for the general population, it's been mostly stagnation or decline. Majority of the population uh, can barely get by from paycheck to paycheck. The corporate power has greatly increased. There's been a process of monopolization of the society across the board. It's part of the whole system. Very damaging to consumers. Uh, very beneficial to the corporate sector. At the top of the corporate sector and the ultra-rich. It's left people angry, frustrated. Uh, resentful, uh, contemptuous of authority. It's a fertile ground for demigods to come and say, I'll save you. The, uh, and we've seen this happening here, Brazil, uh, Turkey, uh, Hungary, India. Uh, here is the most important. But it can be controlled. Meanwhile, there are popular forces developing of a kind you said that there are, are ways to fight back, that, that we have institutions that have some resilience relative to this. What? How? Well, first of all, the basic institutions are still functioning. Trump is trying to destroy them. And the Republican Party, if it's, you want to call it a party anymore, is basically going along. But there's a chance to overcome this. Furthermore, let's not overlook the real politics that's taking place in the streets. Uh, take a look at what's happening in the country. Uh, the Black Lives Matter protests are the uh, largest uh, mass 
social force that's developed in probably in American history very rapidly. Enormous popular support. Uh, Two-thirds of the public supports them. That's way beyond the support that Martin Luther King had at the peak of his popularity. And they're not, and they're, it's, it's recent, it's just coalescing. Programs are being formed. Some of them go deep into institutional crises of the society uh, with uh, engagement, participation, commitment, a serious attention to what has to be done, uh, unwillingness to be diverted. This could turn into a major popular force connecting with the groups that have coalesced under the um, Sanders umbrella, others that have developed the environmental groups and others. That's a period of uh, enormous ferment, uh, lots of options for constructive and positive change. Just to give one example of many, uh, the uh, Sunrise Movement, which has been at the forefront of environmental activism, uh, pretty much succeeded in getting the Democratic Party campaign to pick the most uh, uh, the, the most significant program they've ever taken on global warming, a two trillion dollar commitment to uh, devote a resource to the problem, a plan to move uh, net zero emissions forward by over a decade. Uh, all of this is important. This continues. It can create a new America based on a Green New Deal, which will create a new economy, very beneficial to the general population uh, and to saving the world from disaster. All of these options are open to us. Yes, there's a wrecker in the White House who wants to destroy everything and save himself and these and the forces he serves, those that have benefited from the neoliberal assault. There are counter forces, and it's a question. There's it's kind of class struggle on a major scale and serious chances for victory. Uh, professor Chomsky, you are a professor of linguistics. This is your, your background. And I'm wondering your thoughts on the way that authoritarians... Um, both in, in, in the Republican Party, in the, in the political structure in the United States, and in the media. Um, I'm thinking Fox News and right-wing hate radio, but I think it probably goes beyond that. The way that authoritarians are using language as part of their, their uh, systematic uh, you know, attack, essentially, on American democracy. Well, you don't have to be a linguist to see this, and linguistics tells you. It's just ordinary common sense. So take the Trump campaign. He's now uh, focusing on the radical left revolutionaries who are planning to take over the country, to destroy everything we have, to turn it into a, you know, some uh, extremist uh, communist dictatorship. Uh, this is use of language, if you like, but it's that's the kind of thing you heard from Joe McCarthy, from, uh, uh, let's go back to my childhood, to Father Coughlin, the anti-Semitic uh, racist who was very popular, and much other things through history. Uh, nothing about language. What we should do is just look at the facts that are developing. So take the radical left that uh, uh, Trump is trying to energize his base about. Uh, what is it exactly? Is it Bernie Sanders? Now take a look at Sanders' main programs. Uh, universal health care, free higher education. Can you think of another country that has universal health care? Can you think of one that doesn't have it? Now what about free higher education? It's found it. Rich countries like Germany, Finland, France, elsewhere, poor countries like Mexico, it's almost everywhere. So what Sanders is saying, let's try to rise to the level of other countries. 
that's radical and revolutionary? Quite an insult to the United States to claim that. Uh, he's calling for basically New Deal style policies of this social democratic character, which most of the country supports. The uh, ultra rich, the corporate sector, the financial sector, they don't like it. And they shouldn't be permitted to rule the country. We have it within our power to prevent that easily. These are developments that have taken place primarily during the neoliberal era. Of course, they have roots beyond, which can be reversed, overcome, uh, and turned in quite different directions. It's all within our you, power. Uh, and yeah, furthermore, you, you said, the corporate... Sorry. No, go, go ahead. I was going to say that the corporate sector is well aware of the fragility of their control. And we should be aware of it, too. It depends on consent, and the consent can be withdrawn. I'm sure you've seen that the statements by a couple hundred corporate executives saying uh, to the public, uh, we realize we've done wrong. We have to change course. From now on, we're going to be dedicated humanists concerned with your welfare, uh, so put your trust in us. That's a sign of how scared they are. Uh, every January, there's a meeting of people who uh, uh, modestly call themselves the masters of the universe in Davos, Switzerland, a ski resort in Switzerland, uh, wealthy CEOs, uh, top media figures, uh, people from the entertainment industry congratulating each other on how wonderful they are and so on. This last January was different. The theme last January was what I just described. We have to recognize that we've done things that are harming the public and are now harming us. And we have to tell the general public that we're sorry for the mistakes we've carried out. We've now changed. You can now put your trust in us. Uh, We'll take care of you. Now, this is something we've heard before. In the 1950s, the line was that we're moving towards what were called soulful corporations, not corporations that are not committed to greed, but are soulful, working for the benefit of humanity. Okay, we've had uh, half a century or more to uh, figure out how well how that message turned out. Now we're hearing it again. And it's a sign of the recognition that the control and domination is fragile. It can be taken, consent can be removed. We have the possibility of moving towards a far more constructive, benign future, which will deal with the existential crises that we face and will create a society that's based on mutual support, a concern for people's needs, uh, development for uh, progress, not pro- profit. All of this is possible.